Welcome back to another Mac Zack Attack. Today we have Hail Caesar, the fourth and final precon upgrade guide from the Fallout Universes Beyond set. Hail Caesar is a Mardu commander deck focused on generating and sacrificing tokens for value. So, the face of the deck is Caesar Legion's Emperor, a 4-4 for 4, and when you attack, not necessarily when Caesar attacks. You get to sacrifice another creature, and when you do, you get to create two tapped soldiers that are attacking, draw a card, lose a life, and or have them deal damage equal to the number of tokens under your control to a target opponent. Early on, you definitely want to focus on the token generation and card draw, but definitely towards like the mid to late game. Ooh, chef's kiss, right? Free damage just for attacking? I wanted to attack anyways. <laughs> As always, we're going to take out 10 cards and put 10 cards in to replace them. Let's take a look at what didn't make that cut. Starting off, we have Desdemona, Freedom's Edge. This is a Vigilant 3-4 four for 4. On attack, we get to choose a creature in our grave that is either an artifact creature or just a little on the cheaper side, three mana or less. And they gain escape until end of turn. Uh, so there's a little bit of graveyard recursion, which you would think is like pretty sweet in a like self-sacrificing deck. But I don't think we need it. Honestly, the escape cost is also a little pricey. Right, we're paying the mana cost of the creature, plus we're exiling two cards. So it kind of is a non-bow with itself in that sense. Are there cards that we could exile, like our instants and sorceries, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Um, but I, I'd rather... I'd rather just let it be. Following up Desdemona, Freedom's Edge, we have Ed E, Lonesome Eyebot. So, whenever we attack... If the number of attacking creatures is greater than the number of quest counters on Eddie, we get to put a quest counter on him. He will eventually be sacked off to his own effect, right? This isn't just when he dies. He specifically needs to have two mana paid into him, sacked off. We'll draw a number of cards equal to the quest counters on him. He's honestly being cut because he's slow, right? First and foremost, I don't want... A 3-mana 2-1 flyer that doesn't do anything until I attack. And sure, you know, let's say for argument's sake, turn 3 we get him out. We attack with a little, a little duder we've already got out. He has a quest counter on him. We don't want to block with him. Because, one, he's not a good blocker. And two, we want to be able to sacrifice him to his own effect. I think he works really well in tandem with Desdemona in the sense that he's both an artifact creature, and he's a creature that costs three mana or less, so, like, he's valid on both fronts. You could theoretically recur him if you were going to do a multiple combat phase deck. I think he's very strong. But we're not doing that here, so I'm happy to let him go. Gary Clone follows it up. And Gary Clone is a 1-3 for 2, not bad. It has Squad 2, so we can create token copies of it whenever we cast it. And whenever Gary Clone attacks, each creature you have that is named Gary Clone is going to get a little beefier, but their butt's going to stay the same. So, with just 3 toughness, it actually wouldn't be that difficult to kind of chump block the clones and kind of kill them off. But also, right... It's like, oh, Gary Clone's a two cost. It's like, no, like, realistically, you want to be able to get out, like, two or three of him. I don't feel like he's all that great on his own, right? You need that squad ability. And if you don't have the squad ability, why are you playing Gary? Following up our Gary Clone, we have Legate, Alanis, Caesar's Ace, a four cost two two, which I already don't like. Uh, but when it ETBs, each opponent does have to sacrifice one-tenth of their creatures rounded up. I feel like this has a huge impact on, um, on token decks specifically. So if you're facing off against another token deck, maybe this matters. Uh, and then of course whenever an opponent sacrifices a creature, he gets a little beefier. So ideally he comes out, three opponents sack a thing, 
he becomes a 5-5 five five instead of a 2-2, two two, so a little better. Um, but what are they sacrificing? Unless they only have one creature, they're sacrificing some little dude that they may or may not really care about all that much. Uh, you could also feed into things that care about their creatures dying. I just feel like if we're going to have mass removal on board, we want it to be true mass removal, and I don't feel like this Caesar's Ace is it. Mr. House, President and CEO, follows up that ace and is another slow dude. Uh, so we're paying Mardu for a 0-4. Again, don't love it. We could then pay an additional 4 and tap him. Right, so like, yeah, if he were like the commander that's playing on curve. We get to roll a d6, and if we roll 4 or higher, we get to create a 3-3 three, three robot. If we roll 6 or higher, we instead create that, um, that same 3-3 three, three robot, as well as a treasure token. And for spending treasure to pay for the, the die roll, we get extra dice. You'd want them in a treasure deck. This isn't a treasure deck. So, Mr. House President and CEO, you're fired. <laughs> Rose Cutthroat Raider follows up our CEO. They are a 4 cost 3 2 first striker, and at the end of combat on your turn, if you attacked this turn, you get to create a junk token for each opponent that you attacked. And, kind of more importantly, in my mind, whenever you sack junk tokens, not only do you get that impulse draw, but you get a little bit of red mana. So, I didn't see enough junk support in this deck to justify keeping Rose. Honestly, I'd probably move her to Dogmeat. Dogmeat's generating junk left and right. You know, that's where Rose belongs. Stolen Strategy follows up our Raider. It's a 5 cost enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you're going to exile the top card of each opponent's library, and until end of turn, you can cast spells from among them and spend mana as though it were any color in order to cast. I think it does better work in other decks, specifically decks that care about exile, or decks that care about you controlling things that you don't own, things of that nature. Uh, like I said, it's interesting. I might put it in my Prosper deck, or one of my Doctor Who decks that cares about casting from exile, but I don't think it belongs with Caesar's Legion. Survivor's Med Kid follows up that stolen strategy, is a one cost artifact, which allows you to pay an additional one and tap it to choose one of three effects. So, first effect actually, not that bad, right? Um, we get to draw a card. I'll pay effectively two mana to draw a card any day of the week. Effect number two. We got some fancy lad snack cakes. We're creating a food token. All right, food token's fine. Um, again, I feel like it's a little more niche, right? Three life is cool, but unless you care about artifacts, you know, entering the battlefield or the life gain, you kind of don't care about food all that much, right? It's always like a little incidental. And lastly, target player loses all their rad counters and you sacrifice the med kid. So, it's really only applicable in this set. And I kind of hate when they do that. I don't feel like I need anti-rad synergy specifically. If it was target player loses all counters or something, it'd be stronger. It would be more than 12 cents in the market. As it is, it's a cool flavor thing, but outside of that, I'm not feeling it. Thrill Kill Disciple follows up that kit, a 3 cost 3-2 three, with Squad. So, when it dies, you get to create junk tokens. Kinda cool. Um, if I wanted to lean further into the junk strategy, I think Thrill Kill Disciple would totally get to stay. But as they are now, I just don't see it. Again, I think that, like, Dogmeat really does more with junk tokens than the other decks. 
And if I wanted to take these out and put them in other decks, they would again go into like something like Prosper. Or, you know, Doctor Who, which cares about me playing cards from Exile. Last but not least, we have Vault 11 Voter's Dilemma. So it's a nice little saga for four mana. Each opponent is going to let us create a little human soldier. Kind of nice, we are trying to make tokens, right? So for four mana, we make three duders, ideally. Then steps two and three have each player secretly vote for a creature. Those creatures are revealed. If no creatures get votes, each player gets to draw a card. Otherwise, we destroy each creature with the most votes or tied for the most votes. I think they're just choosing our commander, right? Why would they not? Our commander is a value engine. There's no reason that they wouldn't just choose it. And they get to do it another a second time. They're picking our creatures. If they had to pick creatures that we didn't control, this card is great. And there are cards that are similar to that effect. So I know that Wizards isn't afraid to print that level of power. But, yeah, no. Voter's Dilemma had to go. With those 10 cards taken out, let's take a look at 10 cards that we added in to replace them. We're going to start off with some Rabel Rousing from New Capenna. 5 cost enchantment, has hideaway 5. Whenever we attack with one or more creatures, we're going to create that many citizen creature tokens. And once we have at least 10 creatures, we get to play whatever we exile for free. So... Very quickly going to hit that free spell. We're generating tokens, even once the hideaway is kind of resolved. And this is just fuel for our fire. I think Rabble Rousing is very strong in this deck. Speaking of strong, we have Impact Tremors. So whenever a creature enters the battlefield under our control, Impact Tremors will deal one damage to each opponent. So we're constantly on attack, sacking a creature, and getting two creatures. So at a minimum, every turn, we should be hitting our opponents for two each. Wizards, what are you doing? I shouldn't have needed to add Idol of Oblivion <laughs> into a token deck. Uh, it's super cheap though, it goes for like about a buck. So you're in a token deck, you want card draw. Second effect could be cool, but you, you're, you're here for card draw. Up next, we have the Golden Nightmare of the deck. Myrel, Shield of Argive. So for four mana, we get a three, four that stops our opponents from interacting with us on our turn. We already love it. And whenever they specifically attack, we're gonna create X soldiers where X is the number of soldiers we already control. Guess what kind of tokens Caesar's Legion cares about? Oh my goodness, it's soldier tokens. This is definitely like a little bit on the higher end of cards I would ever recommend picking up as a part of like a budget guide. It sits around 18 bucks. Um, but I think it's really strong in the deck. It's really gonna generate us a ton of value. And when combined with the impact tremors from earlier, really just hammers home damage. We're going back to Lord of the Rings for this next edition, and it's Mirkwood Bats. So, kind of in a similar spot to the Impact Tremors that we've already added, right? So, for four mana, we get a Flying 2-3, but more importantly, whenever we create or sacrifice tokens, each opponent is losing a life. What are we doing all game with Caesar? We're creating and sacrificing tokens. So, huzzah! Mentor the Meek follows up those bats. All these tokens that we have coming in are two power or less. So, really just more card draw. We're trying to keep our hand full. We don't want to miss land drops. Mardu doesn't have a ton of ramp outside of, you know, artifact ramp. And so we want to keep our hand full, make sure that we have, you know, all of our land drops that we can. Mahdi, Emporium Master. This is from Baldur's Gate. It's a 3 cost 3-3. Three, three. 
And at the beginning of each end step, we're going to create a treasure token for each creature that died this turn. What are we doing? We're sacrificing creatures, so they are dying. So we're going to create a bunch of treasure off of this. That treasure is going to ensure that we're playing faster and in combination with all the cards we've drawn. You know, we should be outpacing our opponents here. Ishin, two heavens is one. Uh, Ishin is surprisingly budget. He sits around a dollar, but he's a very strong commander card in itself. I have a deck built around him. Functions pretty well. Has potential for infinite. Uh, not in this deck, but in some decks. Specifically the ones that he helms. Uh, but he's here to double up those attack triggers. Our commander has one. Uh, Myrel, our golden nightmare of the deck, has an attack trigger. We have a couple other ones already in the deck as well. So I think we're gonna we're gonna get a lot of value out of having Ishin on the field. I think this takes us back to Dominaria United. And Ellis Ilkor, Sadistic Pilgrim, is a two cost, two two with that touch. Whenever another creature ETBs, we're going to gain life. And whenever another creature we control dies. Each opponent's going to lose life. Um, so we could have done this. We could have done... Um, ooh, what is that vampire's name? You know the one I'm talking about. She's also black-white. Drawn a black. But she's a 1-1. One, one. She has a similar effect. I don't think we gain the life. Or maybe it's... We only gain life. And we drain on death. Either way. Um, any kind of effect that's similar to this... Could easily slot in. We're going with this one. Last up, we're going to the Weird Clue product. Uh, I recommended a different card from them, I think, back when we were doing the Clue Token upgrade deck. Um, but we have Commander Mustard for 5. We have a 5-5 five five with Vigilance. Gives all of our soldiers Vigilance, Trample, and Haste. And for 4 mana... We make it so that whenever our soldiers attack, they're going to deal one damage immediately to the defending player. Fairly budget. Sits around like 2-3 bucks. Uh, but super strong in this deck. Now with those cards out of the way, all of which were great, we're going to move on to some honorable mentions. And there's quite a few of them. Uh, tokens actually have a lot of support in these colors. Most of which is very expensive. Starting off, our honorable mentions is Aurelia, The Law Above. Uh, so they're actually pretty budget-friendly. You could swap them out for one of the other cards mentioned. Uh, they sit around a buck, you know, maybe two. But for five mana, you get a Flying Vigilant Hasty Angel with 4-4. Four, four. And whenever a player, doesn't have to be us, attacks with at least three creatures, we get to draw a card. And should a player attack with at least five creatures, we're going to deal 3 damage to each opponent and gain 3 life. Now, odds are, unless you're facing off against another token deck, you probably won't see, you know, the 5 swing. But I think 3 swing is pretty reasonable to expect from some opponents. And obviously we're going to be triggering this ourselves. Loyal Apprentice. Uh, Loyal Apprentice really feels like they kind of belong here. So they're a hasty 2-1, but more importantly, beginning of combat, if we control our commander, we're going to create a Thopter. That Thopter has haste until end of turn. So really just more sack fodder to get out more soldiers. Mondrek Glory Dominus is not budget friendly. Uh, they're sitting between like 40 and 50 bucks right now. But, you know, they do double up your token creation. They can become permanent. Uh, indestructible via counter. So, token doublers are just good for this deck, obviously. Moon Shaker Cavalry. This is kind of like a finishing win. So, Moon Shaker Cavalry is 8, they're 8 cost, 6-6 six, six, flyer. When they ETB, creatures you control gain flying, and plus 1, plus 1 until the end of turn where X is the number of creatures you control. You're going wide with this deck, and honestly, let's say you had five creatures when you cast this. This is your sixth. Cool. Your five, we even call them one ones. 
are now 7-7s, seven right? That's 35 damage in the air. You're taking out at least one opponent, but odds are, assuming someone didn't just wipe the board, your deck's going to have way more than that. It's pretty solid. Oger Tech, Deepest Foundation, follows up that cavalry. It is not a token doubler, but rather a token tripler. It's surprisingly budget. Uh, sits around 20 bucks, maybe 25 on the high end. But they're here to triple up those tokens. They do cost a little more than Mondrak Lori Dominus at, you know, six mana versus four. But even so, they're a strong addition. Call the Copper Coats is a nice way to kind of build back better. So for three mana, you get to create a number of soldiers, very important, equal to the number of creatures an opponent controls. If you want to target multiple opponents, you could just pay an extra one, an extra white, and they get to choose two, and you could pay that multiple times. Flawless Maneuver, if you control your commander, you get to cast this bad boy for free. Your creatures gain indestructible until end of turn. Uh, just a nice way to protect yourself from a board wipe. Uh, similar things would be the Ferris Protection, obviously. Um, there's a couple others, but I think they're all in white, which is fine because you have plenty of access to white in this deck. Uh, but just, you want to have ways to protect your board from board wipes killing you. Village Rights. Uh, so you have tokens, you're looking to sack them anyway, so you may as well get some extra card draw out of it. There's a couple other things that let you kind of sack off creatures for value. All of them are pretty good additions. Village Rights is going to be the example I'm using. Horn of Gondor. So, whenever it ETBs, you're going to create a single human soldier, but for three and tapping it, you're going to create X of them, where X is the number of humans you control. Your soldiers are already humans in the deck, so again, this is just going to like be a way to kind of pop off, get a bunch of dudes coming in. It's a good time. So, we are way out of budget here with Anointed Procession, uh, but really just another token doubler. Uh, it's good, it does cost like $60, so a little pricey, but it's pricey for a reason. Cathar's Crusade is super strong. So, it's about 12 bucks, you know, 18 on the high end, but for 5 mana, one of our creature ETBs under your control, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. So on attack, you sacrifice a creature, two new ones come in, tapped and attacking, and all of your creatures get two plus one, plus one counters. Wow, seems really strong, because it is. Goblin Bombardment follows that up. Sitting around a dollar, maybe two, so pretty budget friendly, lets you sack a creature at instant speed to deal one damage to a creature or player. So, you know, you basically have a field full of duders, someone goes to board wipe and you can't protect them, sack your whole board to it, <laughs> deal a bunch of damage. Mardu Ascendancy is an enchantment for Mardu, shocking, I know. Uh, so whenever a non-token creature you control attacks, you get to put a goblin onto the battlefield tapped and attacking, and you could sacrifice it to go ahead and give all your dudes bigger butts for the turn, but it's really here for that first effect. But guys, that is the upgrade guide, honorable mentions, all that jazz. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and hit like and subscribe, maybe even ring the bell to ensure that you never miss an episode. I don't know that we're gonna have Thunder Junction ready for next week, because as far as I know at this point, they have not yet been spoiled. Um, but as soon as we get some spoilers, we'll release some videos telling you Nice budget ways to upgrade those decks. Uh, but if there's not Thunder Junction, I have a couple custom builds that I've done recently that I could show off. So we'll go with those. Uh, but until next time, good luck with your builds.